know, I, I, I work in central Vermont and I live in Chittenden County, so I'm really happy to get to this part of the state, which I don't get to do very often. Mm -hmm. I forget how beautiful it is here. So lucky all of you get to be here. And thanks to Gloria and the Green Mountain Academy for having me. Um, there, I'm a super nerd and I love to do nothing more than talk about the Supreme Court. And you know, after a while my family doesn't want to hear me talk about it and after a while my students are done, so I'm so glad to have fresh ears. <laughs> so happy. Um, and you'll forgive me, we, uh, I have a PowerPoint slide with mostly photographs on it because it's sometimes nice to put faces and people to the things I'm going to talk about. But I'm going to have to walk over and click a few times and I hope you'll forgive the back and forth. Um, and also, uh, I don't, the mic I'm wearing is not a projection mic, it's just for the, um, for the camera. So if you can't hear me, please let me know. My, I suspect that my neighbors call me in loud. But, um, <laughs> uh, so what I thought I would do with you for our time together is talk a little bit about the Supreme Court and uh, I want, I'm going to talk about the justices just one by one because I know not everybody knows who all the justices are. And then I want to talk about some of the cases that the court heard this term really to illustrate some broader themes about the court's importance in our public life. And I'm not going to talk about a lot of the cases you might be most familiar with. You know, the, they always come down with those cases at the end of the term that obsess the media's of attention. So I, you know, I hope you'll indulge me in talking about a few cases you might not know as much about. Um, it's just a way to illustrate, you know, really the breadth of the kinds of cases the court hears and, you know, the impact that has on different facets of, um, of the economy, of social life. I always tell my students the one thing I love about constitutional law in the Supreme Court is really they get to decide all sorts of questions from if and how we're born to how we live, how we worship, who we can love, who we can share our lives with, and ultimately how we die. And, and these things really span the, you know, the breadth of all those questions. So um, I was just noting to some of my friends in the front, um, many people don't know it's Vermont Marble that the Supreme Court building is made from, mm -hmm. from the quarry over in Barrie, I believe. And so, um, and if you ever get to Washington, D.C., I highly recommend that you go on a tour of the Supreme Court. You can watch, if it's a day there's arguments, you can watch for five minutes or stand in line if it's sometimes it's busy and sometimes it's not, and you can call. You're sitting, you know, either Peter Walsh's office or either of our senator's offices and just arrange to have a tour taken and I really encourage you to do that because it's an amazing <coughs> building and there's lots of interesting history there. So I'm going to, can I look at me, Gloria? She used to really That's work okay. for her job. Um, <laughs> so this is just a, a picture of, of the court and um, the, this court's now been together for going on uh, a couple of years, three years. Many of you might know Justice Rehnquist. We often talk about the Rehnquist Court. Uh, Justice Rehnquist actually had a house here in Greensboro, Vermont, um, so considered himself a, a second Vermonter. I actually got to watch Justice Rehnquist play tennis once in South Royalton, so that was exciting. Um, the Rehnquist Court sat together for 11 years, and it was the longest sitting court uh, of, of all nine of them. Uh, but these nine folks have been together now for just a couple of years with the appointment of Elena Kagan. So there's been a lot of turnover on the court. It you know, continues. Um, and we'll talk about who those folks are. And, and please stop me if you have any questions. So I'm going to just talk about the justices in order of their appointment. In other words, who's been serving on the court the longest. And uh, we'll start with Justice Scalia, who I always say is like the rock star of the Supreme Court, because he's almost the justice everybody knows. Um, he probably has the most active speaking schedule. He's the most publicly engaged in some ways, um, and certainly among the most controversial. I think you either love him or you hate him. Um, as I said, he was appointed by Ronald Reagan in 1986, so he was Reagan's second appointment to the court. If you remember, Sandra Day O'Connor was President Reagan's first appointment to the court um, and was the first woman to serve on that court. And Justice Scalia was his second appointment. Um, and actually, a, a very, not a controversial appointment at all, and in fact, he was confirmed by the Senate unanimously. At the time he was confirmed, he was serving on the University of Chicago Law Faculty, uh, where Barack Obama eventually came from as well. Um, but prior to serving on the court, um, Scalia was third in the Justice Department during the Watergate scandal when, you know, the Sunday, uh, was it the Sunday Night Massacre when Nixon fired the AG and then number two, and then, and then Scalia was number three, and so had that history with Watergate. 
And when we talk about Justice Scalia, we often refer to his view of judging as being a strict constructionist. And all we really mean by that is that when he interprets the Constitution, he believes that judges are bound by both the language of the Constitution, but even more importantly by the, in, the original intent. And you know the view on that is if the people, we the people, decide we don't like the Constitution or no longer have that intent, that there are democratic processes for amending the Constitution. Of course, it's amended so infrequently, but there is a way to amend the Constitution. And so, you know, we often talk about that idea of judicial restraint. Well, that's where it comes from for Scalia, right? The idea that you stick in those narrow confines. Um, so the next longest-serving justice is Anthony Kennedy. Um, who was born in 1936 and was President Reagan's third appointee. But the interesting thing about Justice Kennedy is he was actually Ronald Reagan's third choice. If you remember, um, his first choice for the seat was uh, Robert Bohr. Yeah. <laughs> and um, he was Bohr, right? In other words, <laughs> there were public interest groups that opposed his nomination because of his views, particularly views about natural law and where law came from, and he was just really seen as a conservative activist. Um, and then Reagan appointed um, Allen Ginsberg, no relationship to uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Allen Ginsberg, who was at the time serving as a, dis a, a judge on the, DC, on the Second Circuit Court of Appeals and was formerly a law professor at Yale. And Nina Totenberg, who was then a young reporter for public radio, um, broke a story uh, in which Gins Ginsburg uh, was rumored to have smoked pot with his law students. Ooh. And um, if you remember, that was during the Nancy Reagan Just Say No to Drugs campaign. And as the joke among law professors goes, his nomination went up in smoke. <laughs> <laughs> and so Reagan was sort of in a difficult political position of needing to appoint a relatively non-controversial justice. Uh, at the time, Kennedy was sitting on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in California, was relatively unknown to everybody, um, and has turned out, of course, in this court to be the most important player on the court. He is, as many of you probably know, the swing vote on the court and, and is in the majority of cases. In other words, he writes in the majority of cases more than any other justice, and so we think of him as the power player, right? He took over that role from Sandra Day O'Connor when she retired, moving the bench a little bit more to the right. Um, a few, but what I find interesting about Justice Kennedy, of course, and we can talk about this in the light of this term as well, is, well, Justice Kennedy is considered to be one of the more conservative justices. Generally speaking, he has been the court's leading voice on, on, on gay rights. And he authored the opinion in both uh, Romer versus Evans and Lawrence versus Texas. Romer was a case in which a California law which prohibited uh, rights for LGBT uh, citizens was struck down. And of course, Lawrence versus Texas decriminalized homosexual conduct. And so um, he really has, I think if we you know, can fast forward 50 years into the future, I think Kennedy will be most known for being an activist in that area despite the fact that he was generally conservative otherwise. Um, and then um, we have Clarence <laughs> Thomas. Now, I don't know if you always laugh, but I think you're not. Um, uh, the Clarence Thomas was appointed by the first President Bush. Um, he was uh, his uh, second appointment after David Souter from New Hampshire. And he replaced Thurgood Marshall, who was the court's first African-American justice and who also had argued Brown versus Board of Education before the court. Um, I'm sure most of you remember that he survived the closest Senate vote uh, in history, uh, in part because of accusations of sexual harassment that were brought by Anita Hill. Um, you know, a couple of interesting things about, um, and you can actually switch that because I can show you the Time Magazine cover of Anita Hill. Um, uh, a couple of interesting things, though, about Justice Thomas that people don't always appreciate. Um, one is, I think, for true conservatives, for people who really are um, really true conservatives, Justice Thomas fundamentally is the only true conservative on the court. And in many of his, his opinions, for example, he argues we ought to go back to the way the Constitution had been interpreted prior to 1936 and the New Deal Court, if you remember. FDR sort of appoint, you know, we think about, you know, the Warren Court, but frankly FDR appointed, a, you know, had control over the court in a more liberal way. 
And that's really where Thomas believes the break with the Constitution began, and we ought to go back to pre-1936. But the other thing is, and I think, again, underappreciated by the public, is that his decisions on racial equality are, are very interesting, and he believes fundamentally in an absolutely colorblind Constitution, and writes in many ways quite convincingly, at least for many of my students, about the meaning of what a colorblind Constitution is. Um, and I always find it interesting with my students, they often have the reaction to Justice Thomas, as many of you did, oh, he's not very serious, or he doesn't ask mm -hmm. questions in court. But, but in fact, they'll often read his opinions on affirmative action, or cross burning, for example, and are really persuaded by his reasoning. So I just thought I would, I would share that with you. And again, I, I, I don't care what you think. I mean, my, my goal here is to introduce you to ideas and then invite you to go think about things for yourself. Um, so, Gloria, do you mind uh, doing the next one? Um, and then we get um, uh, just, uh, President Clinton's appointment to the bench, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And um, many of you also will form our law group. I'll, I'll never, I wish I could say this. I could never pass a confirmation hearing uh, for reasons which I will not share with you unless I've had a drink. But um, uh, she was also a former law professor. And then she headed up the ACLU's Women's Rights Project. And like Thurgood Marshall, who argued many of the you know, pivotal race, uh, race cases before the cart court. She had argued many of the pivotal gender cases before the court, and she was certainly the architect of, of almost all of those cases, those cases that said you couldn't treat men and women differently for things like Social Security benefits, you couldn't treat men and women differently for things like employment. The, the kinds of laws we now certainly take for granted, she was really the architect behind that under the Constitution. Um, an interesting little backstory is Clinton had no intention of appointing her. He actually called Mario Cuomo, who at the time was the mayor of New York City. He was the governor. He was actually oh, I'm sorry. Yes, he was. Right, he was. Sorry, thank you. He was the governor of New York City, and um, he said, uh, "You know, I want you to go on the court." And and he thought about it. He thought about it. He said, "No, you know, I'm going to stay here. I have a lot of work to do." And of course, and he never. That was his last term. So. Um, you know, I, I don't know, it's just a good lesson. If the president wants to appoint you to the Supreme Court, you really want to go. Um, but he didn't go, and um, as a result, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was appointed. She was the second woman appointed to the court, and she, en she enjoys a lifelong friendship with Sandra Day O'Connor, even though most many times they were on the opposite ends of cases. Uh, they were very close and, um, and had T-shirts that made set, one that said, I'm Sandra, and one that said, I'm Ruth, because they were routinely mixed up by counsel. Wow. Um, wow. That's so, terrible. Yes. And, uh, and of course, both of them shared very similar histories, both at the very top of their um, classes, you know, graduated at a time when women had difficulty entering the legal profession, and of course, made great strides um, as a result. So um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is rumored to be retiring during this next year or two. Yes. It's often common that justices will retire when the party of the president that appointed them is now in office. So of course, because she was appointed by President Clinton, the, world, you know, the idea is that you owe your seat to the party. And so it's likely that she'll retire um, in the next year. She has hired law. So how do you know this? You know, when she, so we, we do clerk watch. We, we watch who she's hired and how many clerks she's hired. She's hired a full clerk for the starting term, but I suspect this is probably her last term. And I would not be surprised to hear her announce her retirement. I think she's thrilled to have had two more women appointed to the bench while she was there. And I think she feels like, you know, it's probably time for her to step down. She lost her husband a few years ago to whom she was extremely close and um, is likely to give up that seat. So um, then very quickly, Stephen Breyer, I always call the justice nobody has really heard of or nobody knows much about, but um, he was also appointed by President Clinton, also a former law professor. And um, on the other side of the Watergate scandal from Scalia, because he was an aide to Cox during the Watergate <laughs> scandal, um, you know, Breyer's a very interesting figure, and his opinions are very technical. Um, if, you're, if you're arguing before the court, the last thing you want to do is get into a long diatribe with Breyer because his questions go on and on and on and on. 
Um, and, and interestingly, although often the cases that make the news have to do with sort of hot button social issues, in fact, he's actually fairly deferential to business interests. And so even though he votes with the, the liberal block of the court often on you know, those kinds of issues, really his jurisprudence is much broader than that. Um, and so then um, that takes us up to the second uh, George W. Bush, uh, the second George President Bush, um, who got a couple of appointments as well. Uh, Chief Justice Marshall being the first one. And if you remember, Marshall actually was nominated and confirmed to replace Sandra Day O'Connor. And then when Rank was unexpectedly died that summer, he was then elevated to Chief Justice. And so he wasn't, he wasn't originally nominated for the Chief Justice post. He was actually clerk to Justice Rehnquist. Um, and um, of course, many, you know, we also always like to remember that you know, when he administered the oath to President Obama, <laughs> Um, uh, he had actually, it was his mistake, um, Obama had voted against his nomination, one of the few <laughs> senators who had voted against his nomination when he was confirmed. So there's always this, you know, I mean, people make up these stories, who knows, but there's always a sense that the two have had some acrimony between the two of them. Um, but Marshall's actually um, turned out to be a much more complicated figure for reasons I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, but he's also very funny, and he's really delightful to watch at oral arguments. He asks very good questions. Um, he runs a very good court. As, in terms of the job of a chief justice, which is sort of the administrative duties of that, he really has high, his colleagues hold him in extremely high regard. Um, my favorite story about the chief justice is um, not long after um, uh, September 11th, you know, I think it was around 2003, while people were still very edgy about things, the lights went out, a light bulb blew out in the court, but of course people didn't know that, and he calmed everybody down by joking, well, I guess we're more in the dark now than we've ever been, and it, <laughs> was, uh, it brought some levity to the court. So, uh, and then if you remember, um, Samuel Alito is, uh, was uh, President Bush's second appointment to the court. Um, his wife, Laura Bush, had really wanted him to appoint a woman to that seat, and so the original nomination went to Harriet Myers, if you remember. Mm -hmm. uh, Harriet Myers was serving as White House counsel at the time, um, and uh, she had a very difficult time. It, you know, she really wasn't prepared for the kind of rigor of that process, and ultimately withdrew her nomination. And then Alito, who came off of the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, which is Pen you know, the Pennsylvania area, um, was appointed. Um, he, he came with a much stronger conservative background than Roberts did, and I think that has played itself out for the most part. Like Scalia, we say he writes with the, the heel of a stiletto. You know, he's a very sharp writer. Uh, but very interestingly, um, he has also sort of taken on a secondary um, personality as sort of an animal rights activist. And uh, there, was a, there was a case a few years ago called United States versus Stevens in which the um, Congress had passed a law that outlawed uh, the depiction of animal cruelty under the theory that, it, I mean, it's a law in case, you know, there were these, crush, these videos that were sexual in nature, and, and Congress said, well, we need to pass this to protect animals, and, 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 and the court said, well, protecting animals is not reason enough to suppress First Amendment rights, and Alito was the only one who said, no, protecting animals really is enough to suppress First Amendment rights. Um, and, and, well, and that goes really deeply out of sort of a sense that the law ought to draw moral boundaries. And, and so, you know, that's where it came from. But, but people really look at him in the animal rights community as a real ally. So, um, again, a very sort of interesting nuance to his career. And so those were the Bush appointees. And then, of course, as you know, uh, President Obama has now had two and, and will likely have a third appointee. Uh, Sonia Sotomayor, who was the first, uh, his first and the first Latina justice to serve on the court, off the Second Circuit, and um, and then when she was on the um, district court, she broke the baseball strike. That's sort of what she was famous for. Um, very interesting. She generally, in the her first term, voted with Ginsburg and Breyer about ninety percent of the time. But over time, that has really shifted, and she's become quite an independent voice on the court. Um, sometimes being with the majority on things and sometimes not. She's become, she really is one of the justices who's become more of a First Amendment absolutist um, on the court from that perspective. 
Um, and as you know, she's really also really stepped out and also become, I think, a public persona. She's a new biography out, uh, not a biography out. Uh, she was here in Vermont a couple of years ago. Senator Leahy had her come speak, and there were about, I don't know, was anybody there when she came to speak? Um, the Senator Leahy invited her. She came up over to Randolph. Were you there? There must have been seven or eight hundred. I mean, it was huge at overflow capacity. She was just uh, very personable talking about her own background and what led her here. Um, and then finally, um, Elena Kagan, um, also a former law professor, um, and then dean of Harvard Law School. She served in the Clinton administration, by the way. People forget that she was actually um, in the White House Counsel's Office for a while. Um, she was the first woman also to serve as Solicitor General, so we had already gone through a fairly you know, difficult confirmation hearing, so she was an easier nominee for President, um, for President Obama to put. Um, but the interesting thing about her, she was the first appointee with no judicial experience in 40 years. In other words, for about 40 years, um, the, the conventional wisdom was that presidents would appoint people off a lower court bench, either a state court bench like Sandra Day O'Connor, but most, most likely off one of the federal circuit courts. And she broke that, um, she broke that trend. And so, uh, and so I suspect that now going forward over the next, say, 10 years, I suspect we'll see, likely see more justices who don't come right off the bench. And the wisdom for, of course, appointing somebody off the bench was that you knew what they thought. And so you could bet whether or not they would be reliable. Uh, of course, that was not the case with Justice Souter. And just like we talk about being bored, right, being opposed by public interest groups, we also talk about being suitored, which means that a president nominates somebody who turns out not to be what he expected to be. And of course, the, the most famous suitored story actually came before Souter, which was when Eisenhower appointed Earl Warren to the bench. Um, and many people don't remember that. Eisenhower and Earl Warren were, were stuck in a, um, a battle for the Republican nominee for president. They cut a backroom deal, and Eisenhower said, if you give me the nomination, I'll give you the first seat on the Supreme Court. So that was the deal, and of course, right, into, right away, the, the Chief Justice, I think it was, uh, I think it was then Chief Justice Roberts, uh, died in office, and um, he had died on the bat, you know, died while he was on, and so, I, uh, Warren got the Chief Justice spot, and of course Eisenhower always says it was a, the worst damn decision he'd ever made, because Warren turned out to be exactly the opposite of what Eisenhower had hoped for in a justice. So, those are the you know those are the stories that happen. So, uh, uh, I think there was a lot of attention brought to the court and its jurisprudence because of last year's health care decision, and I know many of you probably thought about that decision and talked about that decision. Um, and I think what was interesting about that decision, not just in terms of the outcome, um, because now we know that your you know, health care is a tax, uh, which wasn't, the, you know, the, if you didn't know that before, but was that the outcome of that case was unexpected. In other words, people had expected it to split around along different lines. They had expected the reasoning to be different. Really, nobody who watches the court with any closeness ever thought it would turn on the tax and spend question, which it did, and not on the Commerce Clause. And so one of the things I think is interesting about the health care study is sort of the unexpected nature of what the court did. Um, but also, and I think this cartoon suggests it, you know, it really it reminds us about the ability of the court to strike down legislation of, of Congress. And, and really the enormous power that the court has as an anti-majoritarian institution. Because remember, you know, when you vote for the president, your vote counts a little. When you vote for your senator, your vote counts a lot. Uh, but we don't vote for the Supreme Court, and yet they have the power to not just interpret the Constitution, but to strike down laws. And, and so in some ways, although they're the least studied and talked about and covered institution of, of, you know, of government, you know, they in fact I think are among, you know, are the most powerful. I always say to my students, I think the court really is the most powerful of the three branches of government because it has the power to strike down and reverse the democratic process. Now you might think that's a good thing sometimes and a bad thing sometimes, but that's really what, what their power is. So the cases I want to just briefly talk about, because I want to give us lots of time for conversation, 
um, are, are some cases you may or may not be as familiar with, but we'll go through these just as a way to talk about some of the big issues. And I'm going to start with the DNA patent case. Um, I mean, how many of you followed this case a little bit? How many of you followed? So this case and the soybean case I'm going to talk about next, I think are fascinating because they show you where new technology meets old constitution. Because when you think about it, when the constitution was written, you know, the, we, could, we couldn't even imagine all the technological advances we have. And yet the court has to figure out how to balance all of the things it needs to balance in a world of technology that, you know, was never contemplated. Um, so the Association for Molecular Pathology versus uh, Myriad Genetics um, involved a, a, the patenting of genes. And so what Myriad had done is it had discovered through its, you know, its own lab work the two genes that are linked to breast and ovarian cancer. And if you remember, I mean, it's just sort of coincidental, the Angelina Jolie, everybody recognized Angelina Jolie. If you remember, right around the spring, there was a lot of press around her because she had decided to have a mastectomy um, because she carried these genes. So these were actually the genes she carried that Myriad had discovered. And she did so as a prophylactic measure because her family, her mother and an aunt, you know, she had a long history of, of breast and ovarian cancer in her family, so she did this. And of course, the, because they not only patented the gene, but Myria had actually then created a test for that gene, right? And so they sought patent protection, not just for the test, but for the genes themselves. And the argument was that we've invested all of this money in the discovery of the, of the gene, and then the afterproducts that come from the gene, and we should be able to patent it and have exclusive rights to it. So the fundamental question is, can you patent genes? Um, although the case was actually as much about sort of women, it became also a case about women's rights, which is the other thing I think is interesting, because it involved the ability of women to access these tests at a reasonable cost. That was the subtext of this case. So Angelina Jolie can afford this test, but for the vast majority of women, their insurance companies won't cover it, and it because it's extremely expensive. And so when we talk about patenting genes, part of what we're talking about is making medical care or medical testing more widely available. And some of you might be following Senator Leahy's efforts in our own state to make these tests more available. So one of the things that I think is interesting about this case was, you know, one, that this is fundamental questions, can you patent genes? Uh, but two is that it was a unanimous decision. And we, the media always focuses on those decisions which, which aren't unanimous, but this is one where the court spoke with a unified voice and they said, you cannot patent things that naturally occur. It's organic. In other words, you didn't create the genes, you didn't, you know, you didn't make the genes, there was no novelty in the, you know, in, in, certainly maybe in the discovery, so you could certainly patent, for example, the, the, the technology you use to discover the genes, but the genes themselves are not patentable and therefore that you can't keep a lockdown on the test under that. Under that. Um, and so what that means, of course, now, as I was saying, that this test for women will be, that Angelina Jolie took, will be much more widely available to women um, at a much less cost. And Senator Leahy, I said, is just coincidentally here in Vermont leading that charge in the Senate. Um, but it, it's a case where you, I think the case is interesting because it, it shows you science, sort of gender equality questions, healthcare questions, all come together before the court and to think about the ability of the court to de really to decide whether or not this technology will be widely available. And of course the business community sided with the lab because they said, you know, like all patents, the, the reason to have patents of course is to invest in to give businesses the incentive to invest in the, the lengthy discovery, right? This is very expensive to do, and we can't get a reasonable return on investment unless we can exclusively own the rights to that for a period of time. Uh, the court ultimately rejected that argument in this case. Um, but they didn't reject it in another case that's gotten talked about quite a bit, and uh, you might be more familiar with, because I think a lot of Vermonters are familiar with Bowman versus Monsanto. And that case involved um, a farmer, 
uh, Mr. Bowman out in Indiana who um, uses Roundup Ready soybeans. You, I, I did not know what they were. So, um, but Roundup Ready soybeans are soybeans that are genetically modified. So you can spray Roundup. You know, people use it in their gardens, right? That Roundup Ready, you know, to kill weeds. Well, they use that for you know mass agricultural farming as well, and it makes it resistant. So it's really just an herbicide. And what it, I mean, uh, right, is that the word, not an herbicide, is that right? Yeah. Right, so what it does is it kills the weeds, but it doesn't kill the soybeans, right? Does that make sense, right? So the soybeans become resistant to Roundup. So that's what they talk about Roundup, right? That's what, I never, I, I, one thing about being a kind of law scholar is you learn all sorts of things you never know. But here again, oh, you know, old constitution meets new, you know, meets new technology, right? And the question becomes whether or not so what the farmer does is he takes the soybeans and he plants them and they grow into beans he can sell. And he says, well, you know, I can do a second planting, right? You can do a second planting of these beans. And so what he does is he goes to a feed grain and he takes seeds that have self-replicated, right? Now they've replicated and he replants them and they grow. And he does it for eight years. So he's bought one set of beans from Monsanto and then he's used the replicate, right, because beans self-replicate, self-replicating technology. They replicate and he plants them again. And the question was whether or not he had to pay Monsanto for the use of those beans because uh, Monsanto had to patent on those genes and could require you to, uh, you know, the genetically modified beans, could require you to pay each time you use them. Same theory as, you know, the... The, 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 the DNA case, which is we've invested all this money in Roundup Ready soybeans, and in, in order for us to make our return on investment, we have to require farmers each time they plant the soybeans to pay us for them. Right? Makes sense. Of course, now, a lot of people here in Vermont, as you know, Vermont's trying to pass a genetically modified uh, a GMO labeling bill. There's been a lot of acrimony with Monsanto, who says that even if beans drift into your yard, even if you didn't buy the beans, and you have you have seed drift, you have to pay Monsanto for these. So a lot of people don't like Monsanto. Um, Monsanto hired Seth Waxman to be their lawyer. And I raised that, if you remember, Seth Waxman is a former Solicitor General. Um, and is part of this very elite Supreme Court bar. So, you know, it, 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 it it, it increasingly is the case that only about you know, only a handful of people, about 30 of them, go before the court all the time. And if you're, you've got a big case before the court, you don't use your regular corporate lawyer, or you've got a big case before the court, the attorney generals almost never go up there anymore, the public defenders almost never go up there anymore, it, it is now increasingly common, and in fact, it's almost malpractice to send somebody to the court that isn't part of this very elite bar. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what happens is a lot of these lawyers have come from a very high level positions like former solicitor generals, or they've been clerks to the court, so the court knows them and knows them well. Um, and many of them sort of get their experience at the, uh, the, these very handful of law firms that handle these cases that take pro bono, for example, criminal defense appeals. You know, cases where there's no money in it, they'll get their practice doing those cases pro bono. So it's really interesting, because if you come from like a cheap state like Mississippi, <laughs> and you say you've got a criminal case for Mississippi, right? And I'm just picking on Mississippi because it's easy to do. Um, you say you have a, a, a case for Mississippi and the a criminal case, so Mississippi doesn't want to pay the kinds of fees these lawyers charge, so they just send up their you know, attorney general or the prosecutor, and the criminal defendant, the indigent criminal defendant, who you think is the poor person, has the best lawyer, you know, money could buy, except he gets it for free. And it's really interesting, because I think a lot of the cases the court's heard over the last five, about seven or eight years, have really cut in favor of criminal defendants, uh, sometimes surprisingly so, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that who's handling these cases now are no longer the public defender who saw the person at trial, but there's this very elite Supreme Court bar. Yeah, isn't that interesting? People don't know that. Um, but in any event, going back to um, Mr. Bowman, um, Mr. Bowman lost his case before the court. Um, 
Uh, Sachs Wathman argued it, and the, the contrast between Mr. Bowman's lawyer, who had handled this case from the very beginning, was his local lawyer, should never have gone. Because could not, I mean, it is, it is very difficult work, right? And you think, you prepare, 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 and, but generally speaking, it's very difficult work. But he lost, and he also lost 9-0. This was also a unanimous decision. And here the court sort of, you know, says, well, this isn't, you know, they, they created the beans, self-replicating technology, just the fact that it's a bean doesn't matter because it's been genetically modified, they've created this technology, the farmer has to pay each time the farmer uses it. Um, so small farmers sort of lose out on this because that was primarily who, the, who this affected. The large agribusiness, they have deals with Monsanto, they buy, you know, they're negotiating very contracts at very high levels. Who it really affects are small farmers who really, you know, who are really working on very slim margins. But here's the interesting thing about this case. Sex Wethman said in argument, genetically modified soybeans are the fast, are, were the world's fastest growing technology in the world ever. And something like, and I'm, I'm not sure exactly the number, so forgive me if I got this wrong, I believe he said 90% of all soybeans now grown in the world are Roundup Ready. I mean, the, the number, I mean, it was shocking how quickly the technology has grown. So here again, another place where the court, you know, you know, old, you know, old court meets new, new technologies. Um, so that's a little look into how the court has handled these kinds of technological questions. But now let me talk a little bit about the surveillance question. And I know this has been on everybody's mind uh, because of Edward Snowden and his revelations about the NSA programs. Well, I, I've always been surprised that the, the, the press never talks about Clapper versus Amnesty International, which the court decided earlier this year that also had to do with NSA wiretapping. Um, this particular law involved um, the ability of FISA courts to approve warrantless wiretapping of non-American citizens abroad. So. Now, the Edward Snowden example is about American citizens, right, or the ability of the government to gather information um, without, uh, you know, outside of FISA for, uh, you know, domestically. But this involved uh, international uh, foreign nationals. Um, and the suit was brought by lawyers and journalists and human rights organizations challenging this. And the theory was is that, look, we don't know if our conversations are being recorded or not. We have clients, you know, in human rights context, we go abroad, we work with dissident, right? We want, you know, Amnesty International as well, people abroad we work with. Our conversations could be being recorded. The journalists say we might have sources, right, that we're working with. Lawyers say we represent people in other countries, right? Guantanamo, think about people in Guantanamo, right? There are our conversations being recorded? We don't know. We want the court to review this law because we believe it violates the Fourth Amendment, right? That the government needs to get a warrant from a, from a civilian court before, the, before they can wiretap. Now, the court says in a split decision, the newspapers, Amnesty International, the lawyers, they don't have standing to sue. Standing means they're not properly before the court. Why weren't they properly before the court? They couldn't prove they were wiretapped. In other words, in order to challenge the law, you had to show that you were actually harmed by the law. And they couldn't show they were harmed by the law because they couldn't prove. They, if this, is, with this is just theories, right? We think we could be, hypothetically, this could happen, as opposed to this actually has happened. Now, here's what's interesting about this case. So the case gets dismissed. We ne it never reaches the merits. In other words, you know, the court never has to answer the question about whether or not the government should get warrants for this. But more interestingly, and this is why I'm so surprised nobody's talking about this relative to Edward Snowden, is it makes it very hard now to even challenge any wiretapping cases, you know, foreign wiretapping, because the, the, the court has set the bar that you actually have to prove you've been wiretapped or your conversations have somehow been intercepted. And of course, many people argue, but the very nature of these programs is clandestine. So, you know, how would you know, right? In other words, it, 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 if, it's, if it's secret, you don't know, and if you don't know, you can't prove it. But uh, 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 Justice Alito, who wrote the opinion for the court, said, 
we are not in the business of answering hypothetical questions. That it's extremely important if these kinds of questions come before us, we have to really be able to assess what the nature of the harm actually was. And we can't do that in a hypothetical world because that would put us in the place of just second guessing policy decisions. The court isn't in the business of doing policy, it's in the business of deciding actual, concrete, particularized harms. And so, um, you know, the court dismissed the case. And in, in some respects, gave a great deal of deference to the Obama administration to the, and to the government who said, you shouldn't hear this case, um, to carry out these programs until they actually do harm to a particular party. So I just think it's an interesting case to, to highlight, um, just in light of the broader national conversation sparked by Edward Snowden. And I know people can agree or disagree, both about, you know, should he have leaked, should he not have leaked. Um, and it could agree or disagree about whether or not the government should really be able to engage in these kinds of activities. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the consequence of the Clapper decision is it's made it harder for the court to review it. Now, that might be a good thing, because what it does is that it gives questions of national security, really leaves those in the hands of the administration, right? Where people say, well, that's where it properly belongs. Um, on the other hand, you know, the other side of that argument is that, well, people have individual rights and the court is there to protect those rights against an oppressive government, right? That's the whole point of individual rights is to have the court step in and enforce them. And, th and this case, I think, really highlights both of those tensions. Um, the next case I want to talk about is Cobell versus Royal Dutch Petroleum, which is Shell Oil. Do people know about this case? People follow this case a little bit? So this is a really interesting case, and again, it's sort of the next step into the conversation about the court's role, not just in you know domestic, you know domestic and foreign policy relative to the war on terror, but this is an interesting case relative to international human rights more broadly. So the case grows out of um, the Delta Niger, in which there were accusations that um, uh, the government there was. Um, funding, I'm uh, not the government, that Shell Oil, that Royal Dutch Petroleum was funding through the government, uh, you know, using the government to suppress dissidents who were protesting Shell Oil's presence in the Delta Niger. So essentially you had human rights activists and environmental activists protesting Shell Oil and the argument was that Shell Oil was then employing people to suppress their and, and, and kill people, jail, you know, people were killed, people were jailed, um, many people were injured. And so if, 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 if Shell Oil had actually done this, that would have been a violation of the human rights of those people because they were working in conjunction with the government, right? Does that, does that backstory make sense? This has nothing to do with the United States, right? This happens in Niger. Niger. In Niger. And it is about a Dutch petroleum, which is Dutch, not an American company. But there's a law in the United States that theoretically at least seem to have invited any, anybody to bring a case involving essentially human rights violations before the court, whether or not that happened on American soil. So now, um, the case was very interesting because Many people argue that the Supreme Court should, in fact, step in and hold you know, Shell Oil responsible for this and that it could assume jurisdiction over human rights worldwide. Um, of course, the, uh, the flip side of that argument is nothing to do with the United States, and while there might be other tri international tribunals that could address those, that the nexus between what Shell Oil does and American interests is too attenuated. So even the law, though, even though the law is written broadly, the court couldn't possibly assume jurisdiction over that case. Um, the case went up actually last term, um, and then the court reheard it. They, they, they changed the question a little bit and they reheard it. I wanted to introduce this case to you in part because the lawyer for Dutch uh, for Royal Dutch Petroleum is Catherine Sullivan, uh, also former law professor. Uh, Dean of Stanford and known to Vermont because who does she represent in Vermont? Vermont Yankees. She represents Vermont Yankees. She's Yankee. Vermont Yankees lawyer. Oh. I know, I thought you would find that interesting, oh, right? Yeah. Yes. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. yeah. She's like, 
I mean, she she would actually have been, she was on the short list for Elena Kagan's seat at the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. um, just like an interesting backstory, when she went to go be dean of Stanford, mm -hmm. she had to become a member of the bar. And in California, they don't let you wave in from anywhere. So Kathleen Sullivan, considered the most brilliant constitutional law scholar in the world, has to take the bar exam in California. <laughs> and maybe you remember she failed it. <laughs> and, 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 and well, I, I, I can assure you there is no way I could pass a bar exam at this point in my career, so I am completely sympathetic to what happened to her. The press around it was just bad enough that um, President Obama went with Elena Kagan. So at least that's what the, you know, that's the, that's the back story people talk about. Uh, in any event, the, the court held in favor of, of Royal Dutch Petroleum and said, you know, without a stronger nexus between U.S. interests and what happened, happened in the Delta Niger, we aren't, there's no way we can get involved in this case. We don't have jurisdiction. In that case, it limits its own power, right? It doesn't take power that arguably Congress could have given it. It limits its own power. Um, uh, and many people feel like it was a real blow to the human rights community because they really were looking to the U.S. court which, you know, to do that. We're not part of the International uh, Criminal Tribunal, for example. The United States doesn't participate. We're only actually treaty, the only real court, we don't even, we've never given away our sovereignty to an international tribunal. Um, so, I mean, we're part of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, but they have no enforcement power. So. Um, Anyway, so it was a really big debate in the um, civil rights community and the human rights community, but I also thought it was interesting just because of Kathleen Sullivan's role in representing another energy company before the court. And I raise that in part because of Vermont Yankee, because um, here's another example of where who your lawyer is before the court makes a tremendous difference. Um, and and I, I, I remember when the original papers in Vermont Yankee here were filed, and people, because you know, there's a local law firm that had always been representing Vermont Yankee, um, and people said, "Oh my God, it's Kathleen Sullivan. She wrote the casebook on constitutional law," and 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 it, it really was evident at even at the district court hearing for Vermont Yankee <coughs> that having somebody like Kathleen Sullivan makes a huge difference because what she was able to do um, is is position the case from day one understanding if she gets it up to the U.S. Supreme Court, how she'll position it there. And, and you can just see that positioning going on in a way. Um, it doesn't mean that she ultimately wins, although she almost never loses. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's just very interesting. So we can just keep moving along, Lori. Thanks for doing this. Um, I just want to finish talking very briefly about, about the Dome and the Prop 8 cases. Uh, because again, you know, um, these cases ended up having, I think, we, we've talked about them in terms of marriage equality questions. Um, but in terms of understanding the court and the court as an institution, unexpected outcomes. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in a second. This on, the, um, on your left is um, Edith Windsor, who um, was married in Canada. Do you know Edith? Do you know her? No, 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 no. We just know the case. Oh, right. You know the case, right. She and her partner had been um, together for really most of their adult life and had been married in Canada in 2007. We, of course, recognize Canadian marriages in this country. Um, and when her partner died, um, uh, left her, her estate, of course, you know, transferred all of her property, and um, she would otherwise have been exempt under estate taxes as a spouse, but for, the, but for DOMA, sec only Section 3 of DOMA, which says that you, um, that the federal government doesn't that will only recognize marriages between a man and a woman, so she has to pay this tremendous bill. The case was one of many cases challenging Section 3 of DOMA. Um, of course, as you know, in 5-4 decision, the court rules in favor of Edith Windsor and says Section 3 of DOMA is unconstitutional because it violates equal protection. But, <coughs> but even more, I think, to the point was that it's states and not the federal government that has traditionally defined marriage. Um, and, and what I think is interesting about the case is that Kennedy played the role everybody did, in fact, expect him to play, which was to write the majority opinion, furthering that, that you know, sense that he is really going to be known as a justice who decided those opinions in favor of marriage equality and, and, um, and greater rights. Um, I, I should note 
that the implications of DOMA are fairly, of this case, are fairly vast for people. And, and you know, the hub, I mean, I don't know how many of you are married here, but many of us take for granted, I'll, I'll probably also suffer the, you know, the joys and the, you know, tribulations of marriage. But in terms of federal benefits, it's vast, right? It's a vast number of federal benefits that benefit married couples. Um, but what DOMA doesn't do is it doesn't say other states have to recognize same-sex marriages. In other words, it's, it's an interesting case because while it opens the door and many people say, well, you know, it's laying the groundwork for ultimately striking down any law anywhere in the United States that defines marriage between a man and a woman, it was fairly cautious in still giving states the ability to engage in the democratic process around this question. Now, Many groups have filed lawsuits in other states now, hoping that this, you know, that courts will begin to use this case to strike it down. But the, but it was it was definitely a more measured decision, I think, than sometimes gets discussed in the media. Um, and what I think is interesting about that is if you think about the parallel to, for example, reproductive rights. Um, and Justice Ginsburg has talked a lot about this and talked about it recently before the DOMA decision had been decided. And she's often said that she thought Roe versus Wade had been a mistake and that it would have been better from the democratic process to maybe have allowed people to get further along the path of decision making before the court imposed it on the country. And I always think of that Malcolm Gladwell book, what's the tipping point? You know, is there a point at which the court then feels comfortable saying, well, we'll strike down all these laws, right? If it's just one or two states, maybe not. You know, if it's 10, now it's, I think, we're getting, really getting up there now with um, other states. You know, is it 15, is it 20, is there a critical mass of states where we strike? You know, at what point does a state, what does a court override the democratic process in some states recognizing that's coming? So I just think it's sort of an interesting question there. Um, Different from the Proposition 8 case in California, um, I put a picture of Camelia Harris up, um, who started uh, doing marriages just a few minutes after the decision came down. She's the Attorney General of California, often rumored as a potential Democratic uh, vice presidential candidate. Um, so I just thought, you know, I'll give her your name early, and you'll be like, oh, I remember, <laughs> if she goes anywhere. But she's a very popular Attorney General um, and very close to the Obama administration. Um, Obama says she's uh, also the most attractive attorney general, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> huh? he got in trouble for that. Yeah. 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 So, um, in any yeah. event, here's what's interesting about Chief Justice Roberts. Of course, he Prop Eight was just like the uh, Clapper versus Amnesty International decision, where the court says the people challenging the law don't have standing. Because if you remember in the Proposition Eight case, then Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger and then now Governor Jerry Brown. Both said, we're not going to challenge, you know, the, the, we're not going to defend this law anymore. We're done defending the law. In the same way, the Obama administration said, we're not going to defend DOMA. Very unusual historically. That really almost never has happened. Um, very unusual for the executive branch to refuse to uphold the law that was passed by the democratic process. Very unusual. Um, uh, Attorney General Bill Sorrell has talked about the personal dilemma he faced, for example, in having to defend Vermont's law during the Baker decision in 1999, uh, feeling that it was his duty to uphold, at the time, Vermont's law, which only defined marriage between a man and a woman, even though politically and personally he didn't believe that was the case. Now, both uh, we saw that both from Republican and Democratic leaders, right, both Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jerry Brown, the Obama administration saying we're not defending these laws anymore. We believe them to be inherently unconstitutional. And if other people want to defend them, fine, but it's not going to be us. What happened in the Prop 8 cases, who was going to defend the law? Well, a group of people who didn't like the law, essentially. Um, and there the court said, just like the journalists and human rights activists and lawyers in Clapper versus Amnesty International, there was no standing. And so the same concept of standing, but you weren't harmed. You, weren't, you can't prove that you suffered harm because of these laws. In one case, came out one way, and here it came out another. So again, you know, these different concepts play out differently. So I just thought I'd raise these. I wanted to give us plenty of time for questions, but before we do that, I just wanted to throw up uh, a couple of uh, sources. So if, if you really are interested in this, I, just let me recommend a couple of ways to follow it. Um, and the first and foremost is what's called SCOTUS blog. 
It's written and edited by all these, uh, you know, by a group of lawyers that are part of the Supreme Court bar. Um, it's an outstanding website. Uh, they follow the court regularly. They blog whenever the court's in session. They'll do live blogging when decisions come down. CNN, if you remember, got the health care decision incorrect. Do you remember CNN said they struck it down? SCOTUS blog was the, one of the only outlets that got it right, and um, they just do an excellent job. I can't, it's very balanced when the court's not in session, they have people write about it, but it's really easy to follow. It's written for the general public, and um, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I will confess, I get up in the morning and I, I read the Burlington <laughs> Free Press um, I, by paper, because that's my local newspaper, um, and uh, I, then I check SCOTUS block every day. So that will give you a sense of my nerdiness. Um, uh, Supreme Court, uh, Steve, and I, I'm happy to share these with you, is another good website that has a lot of history about the justices and follows the court pretty closely. OIA.org is an organization that records and then makes publicly available all of the oral arguments that the court has. Um, and so you, you can go back, for, you know, you can go back way back in time or, you know, current and, it's really great. I believe now you can download them on podcast. So my students do this. I really encourage them to download some arguments and just listen to them in their car while they're driving. You don't have to get that nerdy, but um, <laughs> but but it's great if you want to hear some of these arguments. As you know, there's no cameras in the courtroom yet. Um, that day may come, but it, uh, it's probably not going to be for a while. So um, the only you know things we have are the oral arguments. And I will give a lot of credit to uh, Justice Roberts because. He has made oral arguments much more quickly available than they used to be, and I, he's moving more in that direction. So we can hear what happened, not just relying on reporters for that. Um, PBS.org did a series a few years ago on the Supreme Court, and they maintained an excellent website um, uh, with the history of the court and video clips and other things. And then finally, there's, a, there's something called Fantasy SCOTUS. And anybody play fantasy baseball? So if you play, if you're, you can play fantasy SCOTUS, and you can vote on what you think the outcome of cases are. They brief all the cases. You can become the tenth justice. There are leagues. Law schools have leagues. Uh, you know, law firms have leagues. Friends get together and have leagues. And if you're really into this, you can become, you know, you can really follow the court really closely through gaming. Um, they post winners, you know, who's the best at predicting, all of that. I did it for a while with my students, but, you know, I have children and I just couldn't ignore them as much. I mean, just ignore them all. They're like, leave me alone, I'm reading this game. So I couldn't do that anymore. Um, so great. So I'll go ahead and stop there. Maybe we can hit the lights. And I hit my screen. Um, but I'm happy to have a conversation, answer questions. Yeah. I have two questions. That uh, Niger Shell, how, was, how did that split? Was that unanimous? No, it, 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 that case was not unanimous. I can't remember if it was five, it was, if it was five Three. If it's Roberts, it's five four. Is it five? You know, <laughs> no, I can't joke. remember. Part part of the reason I can't remember um, is that uh, Elena Kagan has had to recuse herself from mm -hmm. so many cases, mm -hmm. and um, because when she served as Solicitor General, she advised the Obama administration, and I believe she recused herself. That's what I want to say. It was five three. My second question: uh, In your opinion, who would Obama nominate? if uh, Ginsburg retires? Well, you know, that is an interesting yeah. question. And um, uh, the one question would be, would he feel compelled to nominate another woman to replace that seat? Because many people felt like it's progress. We have three. I, I don't have it on my computer. I'd show you. There is this really um, interesting picture of, of, that was taken um, at the Supreme Court, in, not you know, in the, one of the hallways, with Sandra Day O'Connor, in a chair, Ruth Bader Ginsburg sitting next to her, and then an empty chair. And they took this picture to make the point that, you know, two is not enough, and we're waiting for the third. Um, another interesting note about that, just a, bit, uh, just a footnote. Um, when, when Ginsburg came on the bench, O'Connor gave her a beautiful lace collar that you often maybe see her wearing. She wears these lace collars. And then this, his, this, this tradition is carried down, and so the you know, she, they give, she gave one to, uh, Ginsburg gave one to Sotomayor, and I believe Sotomayor gave one to Elena Kagan. And my students and I, when J Judge, Judge Rice, uh, Christina Rice was the first woman appointed to the federal bench in Vermont just a few years ago, we gave her a lace collar as a sort of commemoration of, of that historic event. Um, so that's the first question. Does he appoint another woman? Or does he appoint another um, 
another justice who, like uh, Sonia Sotomayor, you know, is a, another first. So, for example, we've had no Asians on the bench. Um, so do we think about appointing somebody from Asian descent? Uh, I think Neil Ketal, who's a former deputy solicitor general, a former law professor, argued the Guantanamo cases as uh, his private counsel, argued many cases before the court, um, is a likely candidate for that position. He's my law partner. Oh, really? <laughs> He would be an excellent. Well, I mean, that would be my. I mean, that would be my choice. He's going to cost my firm a lot of business. If he goes yeah, on. yeah, yeah. Well, that would that would be my that would be my my pick. And so you work for one of these firms I'm talking about. Well, Roberts was also at the same. Oh uh, yeah, right, right. So. Um. So that so that would be. I mean, that that would be the, his options for that seat. Yeah. Going back a bit, uh, court and hanging chads. And uh, Florida and yeah. decisions about politics and who wins. What what is the residue, if any, from that decision? Yeah. Well, you know, um, uh, a couple of things. One is that right after that decision, the, the 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 public opinion about the court, public opinion, was at its lowest. And and Sandra Day O'Connor's talk yeah. about in hindsight. It was the wrong decision. They should have just deferred to the state of, um, of Florida in that decision. Um, but here's what I think is interesting. Um, you know, from the 20,000 foot view, now you have a Supreme Court, at least in the eyes of the public, deciding who the next president is, right? Now, when this happens in other countries, what do people do? They take to the streets. Well, the Ukraine was one example, right? People take to the streets on these things. And um, so, in any event, I think the, the big picture lesson from Bush, from Bush versus Gore is the enduring power of the rule of law in the United States. In, in other words, even though we disagree with the court, and even though in that case, I think many people felt the court had completely overstepped its authority, that we were willing to, willing to live with that decision for fear of disrupting the balance of power and you know, the, the way we had structured government. But also might just tell you Americans are lazy, right? Or not politically active, too, right? I mean, it could tell you lots of things. But one thing it does tell you is that, you know, it's interesting because the U.S. Constitution is the, the longest surviving, you know, democratic constitution in the world. And that's in part because we have ceded so much power to the court, I think, and that we have been willing to live with decisions whether we like them or not. At least that's my sense of it. Yeah. Do you ever see limitations on the amount of years that um, somebody can be on the Supreme Court now that they're appointing them younger and younger? Um, uh, you know, uh, it's, the states do it very differently, right? So it, the federal, in, under the federal, in the U.S. Constitution, justice, justices are appointed for life, tenure, um, and we don't have mandatory retirement age, so justices can serve, you know, into their 90s. Um, the, the states are different, right? You can look at different examples in the states. So, for example, here in Vermont, uh, justices are appointed by the governor, but have to be re-upped by the legislature every six years. Of course, in other states, judges uh, are elected, and some of those judges have term limits. Uh, my own personal preference is I think the federal system is best. In other words, the trade-offs make me nervous, right? Like, so, um, uh, I, I don't believe in mandatory retirement for people. I just, I just think, we, you know, I think justices can serve. You, you, you know, you, you're either a good justice or a bad justice, and I, or you know, some of you trust, you don't trust, and I think that has very little to do with how long someone has been there. So, um, you know, I know people are free to disagree with that, but I think generally speaking, life appointments to the federal bench have, in the long run, served democracy well. I'm, I'm married to her, so we think similar. Um, <laughs> uh, and this at least, I, I disagree with you because I think the trend is is that they've appointed younger and younger Supreme Court justices because that gives them a much longer lifespan. You know, someone like Rogers and Alito, Alito 
they could be there for 40 years, right. 50 years. And so I, I also think that's what makes people froth at the elections, because they understand that the real thing is, is who's going to appoint the next right. Supreme Court right. justice? And you know maybe they'll eventually appoint someone who's 21 years old. And now you say, well, 21 year old could never be qualified, but surely, I remember as a kid, these guys were always in their 60s and their 50s in there, and now they're in their 30s. They're not 30s, but they're in their 40s and they're Yeah, late 40s. Late I think 40s. Roberts is 48, if I'm, isn't yeah. I right? He was 48 when he was appointed well, to the well, bench? Well, um, uh, Clarence is my age, and he's right. been on, and I'm 65, and he's been there for right. quite a while. Right, so. right. And, and I just think it's detrimental. And one other thing you said that I never heard of before, which I also think is detrimental, is this idea that is only a select yeah. mandarins who go before the Supreme yeah. Court. Well, yeah. that becomes an exclusive club. Yeah. And these people know each other, and they like each other, and they deal with each other. Well, well more, more than that, it's not that the people know and like no. each other. Okay. Huh? No. I think no. more, more so than that is that they're very, the justices, I think, you know, just by, by virtue of human nature, right. tend to they frame the issues in such a way that the justices give more credence to those. And, and that's what many people think is really sort of the problem, right? Which is that it, there becomes sort of an orthodoxy before the court. Yeah, go ahead, Mel. Address the issue, uh, you think it was about the voting rights. Oh, right, I didn't um, talk about the Voting Rights Act, could, yeah. Could you well, you know, uh, the Voting Rights Act, I think, highlights a, a lot of problems. One, it highlights how dysfunctional Congress is, right? Because Congress, of course, you know, so many of these cases the court decides, if, you don't, if we, don't, we the people don't like the outcome, we could simply fix, right? We could fix a lot of these cases because we could have Congress go back and reauthorize the Voting Rights Act with new data, right? So they could do that. Uh, but because Congress is dysfunctional often, you know, they don't do it. Um, the voting rights uh, case is interesting, and, and that was 5-4, and it definitely highlights, I think, the different view of race on the court between, the, between in that case, the majority and, and the dissenters, um, in which uh, the majority believing that questions of race in the country have largely been settled, and that the Constitution, in fact, should be interpreted as a colorblind document. In other words, that laws that focus on race should we should look at inherently suspect if not strike them down. And that was really also the case in the affirmative action case. Even though the affirmative action case involving Texas sort of said you have to use this really really high level of scrutiny and they sent it back, e even though it wasn't dr drastic in striking down all the affirmative action, the consequence is that it's going to be much harder for universities to uphold their affirmative action programs. Sort of an underlying irony of the court, right? Where you know, gay and lesbian citizens really had made tremendous progress in some ways before the court. Um, African American minorities, right, really sort of lost, I mean, one reason is really lost ground between the Voting Rights Act and, and the affirmative action case, particularly for Hispanic and African Americans. Um, you know, the dissent really feels like those problems aren't solved and that part of the Constitution's role is to correct for enduring racial discrimination, um, even if that discrimination isn't overtly evident. And I think it just highlights, I think, the broader split in the United States, right? I think some of us believe that we live in a post-racial world, and some of us experience the world very differently. Um, and as a consequence of, you know, going back to this gentleman's point earlier, you know, as a consequence to who's appointed to the bench, right? Um, you know, it's split. I mean, Congress still has the power to go back and do that. And, and there is a provision, you know, I, I was just reading, there is a provision in the, um, under the Voting Rights Act that was not struck down, that still allows the Justice Department to bring these cases on a case-by-case -case basis, which, which is Eric Holder is now doing, right? They're sort of right. trying to do this, and they're trying to at least mitigate the, the effects of the decision. So one of the scary things that you talked about was in the case, it was a Prop 8 thing, but was the notion that executives at either the governor level or the executive level uh, have the right to ignore laws. Yeah, I, I don't want to say they have the right to ignore laws. They believe yeah. they have the right to ignore laws, and I think that's a debatable question. Right, and so my, question, so my question to you is, I mean, is, is executive privilege keep them from being either liable, legally liable for 
for not enforcing laws and and or you know is there a prosecutional yeah, no. I mean, executive immunity would be would keep them from being sued. Yeah, I mean, the, the answer that people give to that question is, well, if the people don't like it, they can vote them out, right? That the democratic process acts as an inherent check on that. And so if you disagreed with Arnold Schwarzenegger's decision, the way to counter that is to not vote him back into office. Or if you disagree with the Obama administration's decision, is the way to... Now, it doesn't... Now, but that could apply to George Wallace. So yes, in there. that's the point. The right. nullification right. was the was the scourge of the civil rights movement. Right. And Southern governors it's decided similar. to nullify. Right. And it's really no different when these people do not elect to do their duty and right. defend the law. Now they can yeah. do it half-heartedly. Right, which is, I think, what happened like here in Vermont, if you actually right. look at the arguments in Vermont. Right, they, that's right. And, and, and it, it's a really interesting... I mean, what you're pointing to is a really interesting question for which... You know, there's, I don't, I don't know, there, there's not, it's a political answer, right? It's a political answer about what you think the duties and the rights of the executive branch are. Um, you know, and, and people, they're talking about Governor Wallace, as you remember, you know, when Southern governors refused to abide by Brown versus Board of Education, the executive branch called in the National Guard, right? So there is, you know, there was a federalism check on the, on the problem. Um, but the Supreme Court, for example, has no power. It only has the power of persuasion. It has no ability to enforce. Right? It can't order the president, really, to, do, to have done that. So you don't have the same kind of check you did when it's state, those kinds of questions. And so then you have to ask whether it's really, you could just leave it up to the democratic process. Because who's going to make the, there's no way. I mean, I mean, it's an interesting question. Could the people sue? Well. Yeah, I mean that's the question. Yeah, no, you really can't. You really can't, right? Why? Because they get because they have immunity. They have immunity yeah. from official acts. Acts will there in office. Acts. Official yeah. acts. You're both on that. That that would be the consequence of that. Yeah. No, I was going to say, you know, I vote in California. Prop eight. We have propositions. I don't know if you have that in Vermont. No. They <laughs> flip back and forth. Right. Constantly. So. Sure. What would have happened is then they would have just gone back to the voters in California and the tide had changed and it right. probably would have been defeated, yeah, you're right. defeated it, it by would the have voters been, in California. Probably wouldn't have been and that, right. But that's but but you know that's crazy in California too because they we are constantly voting. Right. Like I mean all and, the time. and you know you raise a great point because Vermont and California are the exact opposites of how states amend their constitutions, right? Because California, like a lot of Western states, has direct referendums. So you can amend your state constitution by directly having ballot initiatives. In Vermont, you know, you have to go through two legislative sessions and then to the people. I mean, it's really, it's, it's very difficult in Vermont to amend the Constitution. Um, and again, that's also a question of what do you think the role of a Constitution is in a democratic society versus what the, the role of legislation is in a democratic society. So in the United States, we've, you know, at the federal level, we've preferenced the Constitution and we've preferenced you know, in the state, in Vermont, we preference the Constitution as having, some, you know, having a larger role. In California, you've minimized the constitutional role because of the direct referendum, right? Because it's, and it's just an interesting thing to see how it plays out. I think there's a, isn't there, that's a question, isn't there a real flaw in what you were saying is the uh, antidote mm -hmm. to judicial decisions we didn't like, you resort to the democratic process? Mm -hmm. But it is the Supreme Court, in what I personally think is one of the worst decisions on campaign finance, to have oh, defined yes. a corporation as a having all the rights yeah. of an individual. Yeah. Well, they, well, they had done that, they had done that a while ago. But what they hadn't done was extended the First Amendment rights in the same way. Um, because sometimes we do want corporations to be people, right? And that was the argument of Shell Oil, right? We want to hold them liable in the same way. Um, yes, that's right. And so the people are sort of stuck in that decision with whether or not. You know, with whether to amend the Constitution. That's the only route against that. And you can, of course, do that two ways, you know, calling a constitutional convention or, you know, through the, through the, through, um, through, you know, Congress and then back to the state. Um, and they, the framers made it very hard to do, right? They made it, we've only amended it, you know, 20 some times, right? It makes it very hard to do. Um, I will say, though, just to drop a footnote about Citizens United, and again, this goes back to sort of the powers, you know, the, the inability of Congress to act. There are many things Congress could do to minimize the impact, disclosure among the 
the greatest of them. I have a colleague who works on shareholder rights. Right? I mean, there's lots of things that Congress could do, at least at initial level, to at least provide more transparency to the electoral process and money in politics. Um, you know, and they, they haven't done it. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's another problem that really the core, I mean, the one thing people forget about Citizens United was 8-1 relative to disclosure, right? I mean, you could, you could really, I mean, it's not clear to me at what point the court would strike down a disclosure law, but they've certainly wrote the opinion in such a way as to give Congress fair latitude to try stuff, and they haven't done that yet, so. Um, and, and we haven't done it in Vermont. You know, it's interesting, because I oftentimes will talk with, you know, the legislature about these questions, and it's really interesting, you know, folks are, you know, everybody wants change except when it's against their self-interest, right? I mean, that's really the tough one. You know, and so uh, that, that's really tough. The other thing that's interesting about um, Citizens United is that it's not clear to me that Citizens United, in the end, it's inefficient, right? In other words, what Citizens United does is, is it is it, it, it incentivizes irrational behavior, right? Because it's, it's not efficient to spend, economically efficient, to spend the kind of money. It would turn out it hasn't always worked, right? Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but I'm one, you know, I always, people talk about market correct, and I have a concept, well, maybe it'll market correct, you know, maybe people actually get the idea that it's like a total waste of money, and, uh, but we'll see. Yeah, but it does, it incentivizes irrationality. If it's, if it's any comfort, uh, the ability of these wonderful lawyers that you're talking about, which, and they are wonderful, <laughs> uh, to influence at the Supreme Court level is, I think, I think you over-exaggerated the, their uh, ability to, most Supreme Court judges, and I've known, I know personally some of these people, are, think about these things themselves. They are very independent thinkers. They may have philosophies or doctrine that they follow. They hire the best law clerks they can get who are also very sharp people. Uh, and if you ask a Supreme Court justice or any good judge, how many times has your opinion been changed in an oral argument or by a brief, I think you'll be surprised to find that it's very rare. Yeah, I'll, I'll look, Very rare. But I, 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 sort of, I just push back a little bit because I, I think if you look, for example, at the petitions for certiorari, so, you know, there's a two-step process whenever the court hears the case. One is the petition for certiorari asking the court right. to hear the case, and then they grant it, and then they hear arguments. I think at the cert stage, it's really where the Supreme Court bar has a significant advantage. I, I, I really, I, agree. I think that, I mean, I agree. more so than, the, I mean, in the oral argument, a lot of that's performance, I agree with you, although I do think they do shape things. I mean, you really hear echoes and stuff, but um, they know how better, because of the breadth of the experience, how to position the case for cert. I agree with that, that, that absent that breadth of knowledge, they don't know. That's why I think, that's why I think, no matter what happens, Entergy has, in the long run, significantly, the, the better odds of prevailing because she will be much, she's already positioned, you can see it already, right, the positioning <clears throat> of the case um, that the state just doesn't have the ability to do because they just don't have that experience. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. But they have a constitutional background which they understand what they're presenting. An ordinary, let's call him day in and day out work, it's not a constitutional That's right. Expert. Yeah, and and what and what what somebody like you know you know your law partners or Kelly Sullivan has is the ability to see the interrelationship of things in the Constitution. So I'll I'll use Vermont Yankee as an example um, because maybe you're for, maybe you're familiar with it just from what's been happening, but. Vermont Yankee is about federal preemption and whether or not the, the, the Atomic Energy Act precludes the state of Vermont from essentially denying a license to Vermont Yankee if they were motivated to do so because of safety concerns. And um, now federal, so I might be somebody who works in preemption all the time, right? I might be doing that work. But what Kathleen Sullivan did in that case, which um, is, is position the preemption question not whether who's got power, the federal government or the states, but made preemption seem a lot more like individual rights for corporations. And positioned it by saying, well, this is just like when the states act improperly by denying First Amendment rights or equal protection rights, right? She was able to see 
how there are other places in the Constitution and in the court's jurisprudence that would resonate in this case. And, and that and that is where <coughs> you, you have the advantage, right? That's where you have the advantage. Right, because that was sort of lost on the state, right? I think from the state's perspective, they really hadn't understood federal. You know, people think about federal preemption as, you know, who's got power, state or federal government. Understanding federal preemption as the equivalent of an equal protection of First Amendment right really requires you to be much more sophisticated in, in how you analyze these problems. Do you get involved in amicus briefs? Um, I do. A few, I do some amicus briefs. Yeah, I've done. I I one that I've co-authored. Uh, that I've authored. You know, I've been counsel of record. I, I work on a lot of them, and I do some in state and federal courts. Yeah, I do. Yeah. So there's your there's your anecdote. Oh, the amicus brief. Yeah. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, amicus briefs are friend of the court briefs. And, and, and really, the Supreme Court rules are extremely generous on amicus briefs. Really, anything that would be helpful, any argument that would be helpful to the court, and in order to file an amicus brief, either you just need the consent of both parties, and most lawyers will just consent, or you have to ask the court's permission to file. So there, there are these you know, amicus practices um, that get other you know, views before the court. Um, some of them are very powerful and really do make a difference. And I think a good amicus brief goes a long yeah, way. Don't you think so? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. And that's another place where a lot of the Supreme Court bar work is done, right? It's the hiring of amicus briefs where they make a particular point. Um, and, and we know statistically you can look, I mean, you know, talk about fantasy baseball or, you know, you can, there's all sorts of people who keep data on like which organizations that file amicus briefs are most cited in briefs and most cited in decisions. And we know, for example, Chamber of Commerce briefs can be very powerful, the ACLU briefs can be very powerful, but sometimes just an ordinary brief, you know, filed by an ordinary person can also be very powerful. And, um, I, I think that's right. But again, you know, what makes those briefs powerful, I think, is, is you just know how to write them and they're well positioned, especially to capture the attention of the clerks. Because, because one of the things that um, we underappreciate, I think, is how influential the clerks can be. And, and there's a whole, I mean, you want to get, you want to really drill down on the nerd stuff. You know, there's a whole group of people that watch who gets hired for clerks and what their person, who their backgrounds are. And, you know, do you hire from which judges they're coming from? And, you know, there's a whole thing about that. So, yeah, and we have time. Just a couple well, more questions. Yeah. I'm a total layman. Yeah. You're, you're doing I know. sophisticated, yeah. and that's great. Right. This is why they, they remember uh, the I movie, think it's terrific. Remember the movie it, Adam's Rope where they said lawyers should never marry other lawyers because no, they breed no. stupid children and more lawyers? Right. <laughs> this is just evidence of that. As a, as a, as a total layman and yeah. observer, yeah. My sense is that it's become absolutely, totally, completely political. Oh. And as, I, as an observer. Yeah, yeah. And that I, you know where Alito and Roberts, and you know where um, uh, Sotomayor generally speaking. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Is there, it appears that it's totally political. Is there any way out of this? I don't. Yeah, yeah, no, I that's a great sense question. Of a layman that it, it has nothing to do with the 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 merits. Yeah. how it's argued, and mm -hmm. you know where generally you know where four and four are going to fall. Is there any way out of this? Yeah, I it's think totally the public political. has that view on the on the cases, in the culture conf cases. You know, the culture war cases, right? I, I think you, your observation bears out empirically. In other words, I think in the culture war cases where, where the, 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 the people are divided, that, that more often than, although not always, I mean, think about no, that. I know, it's, but right. it's, it's not 8 2. It's not. It's not, it's not perfect, but I think that's right. And, and that's why, you know, the president gets to a point. And nice. so the, po the politics are inherently built into the process, right? Yes. Um, but I do, I also think the press makes that characterization, it enhances that characterization and doesn't always talk about, the fact that, I can't remember, you probably was off, I can't remember how many cases this term were unanimous, I meant to look that up, I, I keep, was it, it's more than 50% of the, a significant more than 50% of the cases are unanimous, relatively small portion of the cases are actually 5-3 or 5-4. But what I hear is when, um, say O'Connor was there, eight, I'm paraphrasing, 80% right, right. of the cases were 8-2. And 80% of the cases under the Roberts courts are 5-4. Oh, no. That's not true. 
No, that's not true. That's, not true. that's the cases we hear. That's, that's the cases hear. you hear. What we hear. Right. Because the press coverage of the Supreme Court, for the most part, only is, is, is only the big ones, the contentious ones, and, and the justices become characterized. They become um, uh, like, you know, like celebrities, not celebrities, but you know what I mean? They become caricatures of themselves. And so you don't really appreciate the breadth of what they're deciding. So that's why I wanted to show you some cases like the yeah, DNA yeah, case, no, right? Yeah, yeah, where, where it wasn't like that. But I do think, see, the problem with the culture yeah. war cases are this. The public can't decide them because we're too divided, right? And so we acquiesce to the Supreme Court to solve the problems we can't really solve ourselves. And, and so when we do that, we understand that that's where the president's choice is most magnified. Oh, I know, I know. That's where it's most magnified, right? You know where they're going you know to land a vast yeah, majority of yeah. the press makeup and the press breakup. Yeah. Must be the name yeah. of the and, that, and that's why, for example, I like a, a lifetime tenure because I don't, you know, you have to, you know, because otherwise, you, you might be making decisions based on misinformation or incomplete information, Probably right? Probably are. Yeah, but but I think the court's more complex than the way the. I mean, for example, the DNA case I think has significant has significant implications, right? For your health care, significant implications for you know, um, you know how we decide, you know, who has ownership over, you know, our body right? Significant implications. They had to get very little press. I mean, the only reason they got any press was because, coincidentally, Angelina Jolie was dealing with this, the issue. And it was a unanimous decision. So, again, you know, you could say, oh, well, all the conservatives will vote for the company and all, but that's not what happened. Um, and so I do think a lot of the public's view on this is really skewed by you know, what gets talked about. But just one comment, yeah. what you said about the Monsanto. Right. According to your statistics, at some point, Monsanto is going to own all of the soybeans in the world. I, I think that's and right. And that every yeah, farmer in the world is going to have to pay them an annual royalty. Unless, unless, and here's an interesting question, unless, and, and I have to say this, unless states like California, for the referendum which didn't happen, Vermont, or the federal government, decides to label foods, and then, like in Europe, and then the market demand non-GMO, right? I mean, there's a market correction that could happen, well, if, you'll buy. If, you well, have, if you have a short... Right, that's right. Once the panic spikes, right. Well.